11 and 17. Evelyn said something very important in there. She said this, If I'm on this earth, I think I should contribute. Shouldn't we all? I don't have the money, but I can give myself and my time. Let us pray. Father, we thank you as we come to the preaching of your word. Father, as we work our way through this letter, uh, this book of the Bible, Ephesians, we pray, God, for your Holy Spirit uh, to speak with us today in a powerful and mighty and fresh and revealing way. We love you, Jesus. We ask this all in your name. Amen. This morning, we're in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, just two verses of Scripture that we'll look at this morning. Ephesians chapter 5. Verses 15 and 16. Ephesians chapter 5. Verses 15 and 16. And this is what Paul writes. Beginning in verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. In verse 16, we come across a very familiar phrase in the Bible, and, and most of us would probably run, recognize it as redeem the time. But in the ESV, the Apostle Paul says, make good use, or to make use of the time that God has given to us. This idea of to redeem or to use wisely or to use bestly literally means to rescue from loss or misapplication. And so the Apostle Paul is saying is that we need to rescue the time that God has given us on this earth from loss or misapplication. The second key word that the Apostle Paul uses in verse 16 is the word time. In the Bible, there are two Greek words for time. The first one is the Greek word chronos, and it is where we get our English word chronology. Chronology or chronos is tick-tock time. It's past, present, future. It's time in the sense of, of seconds and, and minutes and hours and days and weeks and years and decades. It's calendar time. In the 1300s, the first mechanical clock was invented. And at the beginning of the 1700s, the first portable clock was invented. By the end of the 1700s, England was mass-producing 130,000 portable clocks in which they were exporting 80,000 of those clocks to places all over the world. And we have been on the clock ever since. The second Greek word is the Greek word chronos. And it's a little bit different meaning for the idea of time. You see, kairos is different because it means more like to be at the right place at the right time. Kairos are, are moments in life. Kairos are, are experiences in life. Kairos speaks of, of divine appointments and, and divine opportunities where God gives us to minister and serve in the name of Jesus. One of the greatest examples of this in the Bible is the book of Esther. Let me give you a little background information as to what is happening in the book of Esther. In 587 B.C., the Babylonians conquered the city of Jerusalem and they took a lot of people back to Babylon as captives. Daniel was a person who was captured in the city of Jerusalem and taken back to Babylon to live 
as a captive. But then in 539 B.C., the Persians conquered the Babylonians and took control of Babylon. And so when you come to the book of Esther, King Xerxes is reigning as the king of Persia. And there was a man in his court, Haman, who rose to a very prominent position in King Xerxes' court. And King Haman came up with this crazy idea that he would somehow annihilate all the Jews. And it was at that very time that Queen Esther becomes queen of Persia. And so her uncle Mordecai sends her this message in Esther 4, verses 13 through 14. Let us listen to God's word. Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom. And here's that famous phrase from the book of Esther. For such a time as this. That's Kairos time. That was a Kairos moment. What Mordecai is saying to Esther is that Esther, God has arisen you into this position of authority. God has been working behind the scenes and has made you the queen of Persia to save God's people at this time. It was a divine moment. A divine opportunity. A divine appointment for Queen Esther. Queen Esther risked her life and she saved God's people from annihilation. And that's the Greek word that the Apostle Paul uses for time in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16. Make the most of the kairos. Redeem the kairos. Rescue the kairos. You see, we can measure life chronologically by minutes and, and hours and days and years and decades. But as Christians, God's desire for us is to measure life by the Kairos moments, by the Kairos experience, by the Kairos opportunities to live life to the fullest. That's what it means to redeem or to rescue the time. It means to make the most of the divine appointments, the divine opportunities that God gives to us each and every day to live and serve and love and minister in the precious name of Jesus. You see, the Apostle Paul knew what it meant to cherish Value. Rescue the time. If you will remember, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul is, is writing this letter from prison. And think about the Apostle Paul, as we spoke about last week. Planted 14 churches wrote 13 books in the New Testament. It is estimated that the Apostle Paul traveled 45 to 50,000 miles in his life preaching the Gospel. So think about Paul in prison and how his opportunities, his chances for ministry are greatly hindered as he's chained in that prison. Paul understood fully what it meant to be redeeming the time. Because the Apostle Paul knew that his chances to, to minister for the name of Jesus were very hindered while he's locked 
in that cell. The Apostle Paul also knew what it meant to rescue or redeem the time. Because Paul knew that his life on earth might be running short. At any moment, the executioner could have came. And the Apostle Paul could have possibly had his head cut off from his shoulders. This is a man who understood fully what it meant to be redeeming the time of his life. Benjamin Franklin daily, when he got out of bed, would ask himself this question. What shall I do with my life today? At night, when Benjamin Franklin would lay down to sleep, he would always ask himself this question. What did I do with my life today? You see, it's a sobering question. Each moment, each second, each minute, each hour, each day of your life is a gift of God's grace. And all we can do is live faithfully for Jesus in the day that is called Today. One of the things that we need to be aware of in our lives is what is called the when syndrome. Do y'all remember, this will be a long time ago for some of you all. Do y'all remember when you were like 14? I remember 14, 15 years old. Man. I can't wait to turn 16 and get my license. I can't wait to graduate high school. I can't wait to when I go away to college. I can't wait to when I get a job. I can't wait to when I get married. I can't wait until we get kids. I can't wait till when I retire. I can't wait until the kids are grown and gone and I have more free time for myself. When I get more money, when I get more time, when I get better health, what is the when in your life? God does not ask us to live in the when. All we can do is live in the day that is called today. William Osler was one of the most recognized medical doctors of his time. I mean, the man organized the John Hopkins School of Medicine. But when he was a young man and he was a medical student, the demands upon his life were, were so overwhelming that he almost had a nervous breakdown. But he came across the writings of Thomas Carlyle and it changed his life. And this is what he read from Carlyle. Our main business is not to see what lies dimly at a distance, but to do what clearly lies at hand. Over the course of his life, Osler says that those words changed his life. Much later in life, Osler was speaking at Yale University and he told the people there that he owed his life to a very simple principle. He called it this living in day tight compartments. Of that principle, he said to the students, you need to let go of dead yesterdays and unborn tomorrows. The load of tomorrow 
added to that of yesterday, carried into today, makes the strongest falter. In the book of Genesis, it tells us in the beginning. And then what did God do? He separated His creation by days. How do you build your relationship with Christ? By faithfully spending time in prayer and getting into God's Word and obediently following Jesus one day at a time. How do you nurture and raise your children? By faithfully investing into them one day at a time. How do you nurture your marriage and keep it healthy and vibrant? By faithfully investing into your relationship with your spouse one day at a time. I wonder how many of us in this room need to let go of a whole lot of dead yesterdays and unborn tomorrows and begin to live faithfully for the glory of God in the day that is called today. What will you do with your life today? What did you do with your life today? So the Apostle Paul writes to these Christians, make the most of every opportunity. And what Paul is saying is make good on the chances and opportunities and divine appointments that seem to come into your life each and every day. You see, Paul is, is directing us to live carefully, to live awake, always watching, always ready. Always looking for those opportunities where we can speak a word of encouragement. Where we can give to someone in need. Where we can just simply stop and listen to someone who is hurting. And on and on the opportunities go. Last Saturday morning, I was leading the prayer walk at Rockingham County Middle School. And after we had gathered around a group of probably 10, 15 of us, and we had prayed together, I dispersed the people who were there to go ahead to begin to, to walk around the school and, and to lay your hands on the building and, and to just pray as you feel led. And so I told the group that, hey, I'm, I'm going to remain here at the front door and if anybody shows up, I will just direct them and welcome them as to what is taking place this morning. And so as I was waiting there, I, I saw somebody pull into the lot and begin to walk across who, who worked at the school. And I could see from the distance the stress and the strain on her face. And I said to her, you're working on a Saturday? And she began to tell me about all this work that she needed to get done before Monday because everybody waits to the last minute to get done what they need to get done to get ready for school. And so I said to her, can I pray for you? And she said, sure. So we just stood right there. And I prayed for her on the spot. When I finished praying, she said, thank you. 
you don't know how much that prayer means to me. Would you all do me a favor? Stop praying for people. Seriously. You heard me correctly. Stop praying for people. You know, one of the biggest lies we tell as Christians is this. I'm praying for you. I think it's the biggest lie we speak as Christians. How many times have you found yourself in a conversation and somebody shares with you something that they are going through in life? And when two of you break out of that conversation, you say to them, I'll be praying for you. How often are we speaking a lie? Because we get back to our busy lives and we forget what had taken place with that individual. Stop praying for people and start praying with people. Right there. It might be in a parking lot, it might be in a restaurant. It might even be at the place where you work. It might happen right in this worship center. I've done it before. Somebody shared with me about something that's going on in their life. And so we just stop right there and pray. You and I are given God-given opportunities to live and speak and show the truth of Jesus. And that is why Paul is directing us here to live carefully, to live your life awake, to be ready and ready and watching and aware for the opportunities where we can be salt and light, and the grace, and the love of Jesus. A number of years ago, Mark Batterson got an email from a guy who, who was reading his book in a pit with a lion on a snowy day. And he shared with Batterson that, that after reading the first chapter of that book, that he realized that he was living his life too reactively. And that he needed to start living his life proactively. And so he said to Batterson that when the opportunity presented itself, he was going to take it. So he shared with Batterson that he was on a flight heading to Las Vegas. It was a two-leg flight, so he got off the first flight, got through the airport, got on the second flight, and began to make his way to Las Vegas. As he was sitting there in his seat, he was sitting next to a young girl, and, and just wanting to be polite, he said, hello. But her body language immediately shut him down, like, don't you ever talk to me again on this flight. But he said he just got this impression that something was wrong. And if he didn't obey it, he would miss an opportunity. So he turned to her and said, I know that it's none of my business, but you seem so burdened. Maybe sharing it with a stranger will help lessen your burden. And she did. Sitting next to him on that flight was a 17-year-old girl who had stolen her father's credit card and was running away from home. She was three months pregnant and her boyfriend told her, go and take care of it. She was on that plane heading to Las Vegas to, quote, take care of it. 
So these two talked the whole way to Las Vegas. And by the time the plane landed, she decided to not have the abortion. And she agreed to get on the first flight back to Arizona and to meet her parents who were worried sick. On that day, a baby's life was saved Because one guy had the courage to put himself into an awkward position simply led by the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Here's what he said to Mark. Please know that in reality I take no credit. I was scared to death even to open up the conversation for fear that I would offend this young girl. So it was all God. It's not my job to save people. It is simply my responsibility to plant a seed. What would happen to your life if you redeemed your time by bringing Jesus into everything you do? Look, not everything that happens in your life is some kind of divine appointment or some kind of divine opportunity. But when those Kairos moments come, and I promise you, they will, I pray that you will be ready and aware and awake. And that you will redeem that Kairos moment by serving them in the name of Jesus. My friends, Open your eyes. Open your ears. Open your heart. And redeem and rescue the Kairos moments that come your way where you can be the salt and light and grace of Jesus in a dark, and lost and hopeless world. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Amen. Let us pray.